The first one is a, a good introduction to the next session. Do, do you think we could be more happy if we stopped believing in stories and came back to reality? Um, well, it's a tricky question because as I tried to explain in the last, in the, last uh, the very end of the talk, it's important to differentiate the two, but we cannot uh, maintain large-scale social cooperation without some stories in place. If you just abolish money, the economy will collapse. If you just uh, say, okay, human rights, they are just a fiction in our mind, let's, let's forget about them, the legal system will collapse. We don't know of any way to organize people in large numbers without some fictions, some stories. Stories are not bad. Stories are a good thing if we know how to use them uh, to our ends instead of being enslaved by them. The problem is not with the stories. The problem begins when people be develop such a strong belief in the stories and forget about reality that instead of the stories helping us, we are starting to live our entire life serving the interests of entities that exist just in our imagination. So I wouldn't say stop using stories. I'm, I would just say be far more uh, aware of what is a fictional story which is meant to serve us and what is the reality. So why homo sapiens believe in misum and stories? What enables us to believe? Oh, this we don't know. <laughs> what is it about the structure of the human brain or whatever that enables homo sapiens to do it? It's still a big mystery. Um, we know, for example, that other human species that existed here tens of thousands of years ago had brains as big as ours. Neanderthals, 50,000 years ago, had bigger brains than we have today. But apparently, they were unable to create and spread fictions. We don't have, whereas we have evidence from that period of Homo sapiens creating fictions, for example, from the cave arts or from trade, we don't have any evidence of Neanderthals able to do it. What made the difference? It's not the size of the brain. It's most likely something about the internal structure of the Homo sapiens brain that changed around 60, 70, 80,000 years ago, probably due to a chance mutation or several mutations that perhaps connected two parts of the brain that were previously unconnected or on the opposite side, maybe disconnected, two parts of the brain that were previously connected. And this may have led to this new cognitive ability to create and believe in fictions. But at present, this is just a, a theory, a hypothesis. We don't have any firm evidence. And I think one of the best things about science and the thing that distinguishes science from mythology and from religion is that science is not afraid of ignorance and of admitting ignorance. When we don't know something, hopefully, we don't, don't just invent some story and spread it around to people. As scientists, our uh, mission, our commitment is to say, we don't know. We don't know the answer to this very important question. And this is indeed the case with the question of what was this small change around 60, 70, 80,000 years ago that suddenly enabled Homo sapiens to start uh, creating fiction and to start cooperating in very large numbers. On what should we focus in order to invent and share the next chapter of Sapiens story? Uh, first of all, on ensuring that there is a next chapter. Uh, at present, uh, the future of Homo sapiens, as I think we'll hear in the next lecture, uh, just after lunch, is, is not so clear. Uh, my own impression, as a student mainly of the past, is that we have at most a century or two more to go. We are one of the last chapters, one of the last generations in the story of Homo sapiens. Doesn't mean we'll be uh, exterminated in some, in some catastrophe. More likely, we'll upgrade ourselves 
uh, into something very different from what we are, something which is much more different from us than we are different from Neanderthals, whether this something, whatever it is, will still have fictions and imagination as the basis for large-scale cooperation, this I don't know. Now that we filled the Earth, is it time to bring life to another part of the universe? Um, given what we've done to Earth, I think the universe can do well without us. <laughs> um, but I don't think this will stop us. What will stop us is that we as beings, as animals that developed on the planet in millions of years of evolution, we simply cannot survive in other parts of the universe. So it seems extremely unlikely that Homo sapiens will be able to break out of planet Earth and colonize Mars, not to mention other solar systems. However, uh, our creations, especially artificial intelligence, may be able to do it far more easily than we can. I mean, uh, in a couple of centuries, it's very unlikely you'll see human beings like us on other planets or even on this planet. But for our creations, like artificial intelligence, it will be much, much easier to spread to the other part of the universe. Again, I'm not so sure that this will be a very good thing for the other part of the universe, but that's their problem. <laughs> Do you think that the digital revolution will change the sapiens in terms of cooperation? Uh, yes, it's already changing us. Uh, we are, again, this is a long-term process. We are, if you look at thousands of years, you see that Homo sapiens is becoming less and less like chimpanzees and more and more like ants. Well, we started tens of thousands of years ago, we're a kind of upgraded chimpanzees that can do more, that can cooperate in larger numbers. But still, we're very similar to chimpanzees because hunter-gatherers needed to, uh, to know a lot about many things, they depended they, uh, on themselves, on their own individual skills to a very large extent. As this millennia and centuries unfolded, we created a huge network of cooperation, like an ant's colony or an ant's nest, and as individuals, we became more and more dependent on that. So already today, I think we are more similar to ants than chimpanzees. Each of us has our own tiny niche within the network, and we cannot survive uh, individually. If I look at myself, so I know history, it's the main thing that I know. I teach at university, I give lectures, I get money for that, and everything else that I need, I buy from the network, from strangers, and I don't know how to produce it myself. I don't know how to get my own food. I don't know how to produce my own clothes. I don't know how to build my own shelter. Uh, so in this sense, I'm much more similar to an ant than to a chimpanzee. And with the uh, digi digital uh, technology, this process will only accelerate. I think within a very short time, people will not be able to survive for a single minute without being constantly connected to some kind of internet of all things. Okay. Um, of course, Ryan will answer this question later. Don't you think Homo sapiens are become another kind of Homo? Uh, yes, uh, this actually repeats what I said earlier, that we are in the pro... I don't know if we are already there, but I would say that Homo sapiens as a species, we are the, one of the last generations of, of it. And within a century or two, either we'll destroy ourselves or more likely we'll upgrade ourselves into something very different. Do you think another species could achieve what we did here on Earth on the upcoming thousand years? In principle, yes, but in practice, no, because there is no time. We got there first. Uh, but if somehow you got rid of us, let's say, nuclear warfare or some other catastrophe kills all the humans, I would not be completely surprised if in 10 million years there will be here on the Seine a conference of intelligent rats and some very intelligent rat will stand here where I'm standing and tell all the audience that 10 million years ago 
there are apes on this planet, but luckily for us, they kill themselves and pave the way for the rise of the true masters of life, the rats. <laughs> okay, one, one more. Can you tell us about your next book, Homo Deus, to be released ne next sec September? Right. Um, yes, so um, my previous book is about the human past and how we got here. So the next step was to try to look to the future, uh, not to try to predict, which is impossible, uh, what's going to happen, but uh, to try to map the different possibilities, dangers, and opportunities that humankind will face in the next uh, century or so with a focus not so much on technology, on the technical stuff. Of course, technology will be the engine of all the huge changes that will occur over the next century. But as a historian, I'm far more interested in what will happen to society, to culture, to politics, to religion. So my next book is really about uh, the future of human society, of human ideas, uh, of human ideology. So one last question, will, we, will you come next year for presenting this new book? Oh, it's very difficult to predict the future. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.